Warning, this video contains references to sexual assault, but no discussion of them. And spoilers for Insidious, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Scream, The Grudge, Child's Play, The Conjuring, Annabelle, and The Ring. Feel free to use the chapter selection to skip any of the movies you don't want to see spoilers for. Last year I bought a treadmill for my house because I get that weird restless leg syndrome and I thought I could use it like a hamster wheel. I was like, yeah, you know, I've been running outdoors four or five times a week for the better part of two years. I'll surely be one of those people that makes good use of a treadmill. It's more convenient and I don't need to worry about the weather all the time. For those of you that aren't aware, cardio time passes in dog years. Every minute you spend off the treadmill is seven minutes in cardio time. Eons pass you on the treadmill. Millennia. Empires crumble in the time it takes you to do your morning run. You have to very carefully help yourself through it mentally. You have to break down infinity and somehow make it manageable. You'll be jogging along like, okay, I just have to do 30 more seconds of this, 15 more times, and I can get back to what I'm doing. So in the short span of time that I insisted on trying to maintain my running habit indoors, I ended up resorting to YouTube videos to try and keep my mind off the physical factor, but they were insufficient. People talking at normal speeds just wasn't enough. I needed entertainment blasted into my eyes and ears to overcome the boredom that I was experiencing. I cranked my videos into double speed and tried to zone out during this self-inflicted purgatory of treadmill misery. And I also didn't want to have to sift through multiple videos at once. So I would find like an hour long video, crank it up to two times speed, put it on the little treadmill stand and then jog like my life depended on it. And that is how I discovered this. This video, made by some small creator you've probably never heard of, unpacks all of the movies on the aptly named Disturbing Movie Iceberg, which featured eight tiers of increasingly uncomfortable content. I loved the video, so I ended up watching it a few times, panting like a dog in my office over this silly little treadmill, trying not to think about how easy it is to just stop running and do anything else. I mean, eventually I just went back to running outside, but you know, it was a valiant two weeks of effort. Besides, I was inspired. The treadmill had served its purpose. I just didn't know what that purpose was initially. After a little bit of a consult with my friends and patrons and the overlap therein, I decided to add an I will review all of tier 1 of the disturbing movie Iceberg to my Patreon goals, and tier 2 and tier 3, and surprisingly we hit it. So here it is, a review of every single movie on tier 1 of the disturbing movie Iceberg. Tier 1 ended up being a little bit pedestrian, a little bit not that disturbing, but they offered a good excuse for me to watch a bunch of films with my friends. If you would like to see tiers 2 and 3 covered on this channel, click the link in my description, go check out my Patreon. When we reach the next pledge reward goal, we'll do it. I put up weekly five minute review videos with occasional bonus reviews every other Saturday, sneak peeks of all my videos, polls, posts, and higher tier patrons get thank you cards. And speaking of patrons, thanks to you, especially Brendan, Brody Cullen, Duck, Julia, Carissa Fulcher, and Sam Jones for being my highest tier patrons. Now, without further ado, a review of every movie on tier one of the disturbing movie Iceberg, ranked here from my take on least to most disturbing. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Many of you will know that I work in STEM as a UX UI designer because I never ever ever stop talking about it. And maybe less of you will actually know that I got my foot in the door through coding. That's how I got into STEM in the first place. I picked up web development in my second year of uni, absolutely adored it, ended up doing a master's in it, and now I spend all my time trying to convince every single person I meet to get into STEM as well. Because it's fantastic and whoever you are, we need more of you. One of the best ways to pick up a skill like coding is through a service like Brilliant, which delivers comprehensive interactive learning, teaching you the building blocks whilst constantly testing you with puzzle solving exercises and little challenges. And this is all done in an environment that rewards incremental progress. Having big topics broken down into bite-sized segments offers achievable milestones and personal daily goals, depending on whether you want to crack on with one lesson a day or a certain amount of hours per week, Brilliant offers enough in enough quantity that it it is entirely dependent on how you want to learn. They also teach maths and science. In my opinion, a service like Brilliant is one of the best ways to learn how to code, and their computer science fundamentals and programming with Python courses are utterly fundamental in helping you pick up a really important skill like this. Whereas if you're already well on your way or would like to just polish up some skills or challenge yourself, there are advanced and applied courses available for you too. Brilliant has hundreds, if not thousands of lessons with more added every single 
single month. So try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days with my link. Visit brilliant.org forward slash MertKK or click on the link in the description below. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's premium subscription. Where can you find a better deal than that? Now, let's get back to the video. We're coming in first on the list with Insidious. Insidious is a film I've seen quite a few times, but for the life of me, I can't remember when or with whom. It was released in 2011, which probably made it slightly too late to be a teenage sleepover movie for me. Somehow it is a film I have experienced, and Insidious is fine. I'm sure this isn't a hot take, but this is one of those films that gets off to a fairly steady start with a strong premise, and then builds well, sits on its hands a little bit too long, and blows its beans right at the end. I think it can be so hard for visual horror to land as intended, and this film just wasn't that scary at the end, nor especially disturbing. I think there's a lot to like about Insidious, namely the cast of characters and their own personal arcs throughout the film. My favourites are naturally the ghost hunting duo running around in their little smart casual office dress like little paranormal Mormons, paramormons. The music is cool, but tonally it doesn't seem to fit what the film is going for. It's got those screeching music cues, the opening title is like a screaming, scraping metal, and big red stretched letters like a heavy metal album, which sets an expectation of fairly over-the-top horror. And then we watch a woman getting her kids ready for school and playing piano for 45 minutes. The film is quiet for the first half at the very least, only really hitting the heavy metal title vibe levels of absurdity towards the end, by which point the tone set by the opening credits has been long forgotten by anybody watching. Now, let me set the scene. A young family moves into a new house, initiating our standard horror trope of young family moves into haunted home. There's a mum, Renee, a dad, Josh, two very young sons, Dalton and Foster, and a baby girl called Callie. And not to be crass, I love kids, but that's a horror movie in and of itself right there. After the oldest son, Dalton, falls off a ladder in the attic and hits his head, he goes into a coma that the doctors can't explain. Assuming it was from the impact to his head, Renee tries to make him comfortable whilst holding herself together with string and blue tack, even as her already, and I do mean this so diplomatically, hands-off husband pulls further and further away. And this is where the paranormal incidents really start to kick up a notch. They start fairly small, only demonstrating their insidious nature as time goes on. At first it's the little things, they hear knocking on the door but no one's there, they hear interference on the baby monitor, stuff that could be reasonably explained away, while indeed being weird stuff. After a while it's more tangible things, a man standing behind her daughter, visible through the veil at the head of her cot, who disappears when Rene goes to fetch her husband, a weirdly attractive vampire looking dude who literally just walks through their room and then runs at her, knocks her onto the floor and vanishes again while Josh runs in to check on her. Although paranormal events start happening fairly early on in the movie, which gives the impression that things are about to ramp up fast and dangerous, it flatlines very hard after the first 15 minutes and stays in this constant state of paranormal events are happening and the couple is arguing for the majority of the runtime. This perseveres until the ghostly happenings start to get a little bit boring on our end. I suppose they're trying to hammer home the reality that this house is very haunted, that these hauntings are miserable, that this family cannot stay in this house, and that something needs to be done or they'll never find peace again. But I, I think it could have been shorter. They even swap homes and move into a house owned by Josh's mum, who bears a striking resemblance to Rene, and the hauntings continue, following them because of Dalton, and it's still banal enough that me and my friends all zoned out watching it. There are just so many scares with zero consequence. And this is the key, because as we watch, we learn that Dalton can astral project. He has been astral projecting every night, flying around in the sky, exploring because he thinks it's just a dream, but in reality his spirit is leaving his body repeatedly until he eventually becomes lost and can no longer wake up, leaving an empty vessel in our world that ghosts suddenly take a great interest in. The longer Dalton is out of his body, the easier it is for them to step in and take control of it. It's an interesting possession tale, but I think this film really shines when you start to realise that it's a coming of age story about a dad who needs to learn how to fundamentally give a shit about his children. 
Josh is a school teacher who is hilariously absent from household responsibilities. For example, during one of their first mornings, he leaves his poor wife to set up utilities on the phone in the same room as her three screaming children, while she tries to get them ready for school. When she asks if he can take the kids to school, which is on his way to the school where he works, he's like, sorry honey, no, I'm too busy going to work. Again, the children go to school somewhere that is literally on his commute, and Rene does this deflated sigh we've all done when we realise we've basically been handed a man directly from his mother, and he expects mothering from us as well. Josh, you useless prick. When the ghostly hauntings start occurring, Josh hides from it by just staying really late at work every night, until almost midnight every single day, pretending to grade tests while he naps and watches YouTube videos, leaving his poor wife and his three vulnerable children in a literal haunted house, dad of the year. As the story wears on, Josh realises that Dalton inherited his ability to astral project from him, and he comes to terms with the fact that he was unwittingly responsible for this. As a result of being faced with facts, he stops his denial and decides to help his son by astral projecting one last time, going into the further, the place after death, and saving him. I think this movie is like a great example of boneheaded dads who need some kind of road to Damascus moment in order to understand that, yes, actually, saving your sons from being possessed is the bare minimum of parental responsibility. It's like how boomers separate so-called pink and blue jobs. Pink jobs being daily ongoing work like family laundry, dishes, meals, childcare, you know, stuff that takes all day, and then blue jobs being occasional but valuable things like mowing the lawn, fixing a broken appliance, and stopping your child from being possessed. And then hilariously, maybe even unintentionally, the mum who has been doing all of the work, getting Dalton out of the house, rebuilding their lives, calling in the paramormons, getting Josh to listen and see reason, caring for Dalton while he was in his coma, looking after all the children while Josh was staying late at work, suddenly takes a backseat to everything while Josh walks in and saves the day in one fell swoop. The story was about Josh all along, because he has special powers. You're the real hero of this story, Rene. I'm sorry about the denouement. All in all, Insidious is a pretty alright film, but it's it's definitely nothing to write home about. So I had Friday the 13th on my list of films to watch, but when I saw only the remake was available on Netflix, I decided to watch Scream and Insidious first, since they were available on the platform. I'd figure out how to watch Friday the 13th afterwards, I thought. Of course, I did not realise that the ending of Friday the 13th is spoiled in the first 10 minutes of Scream, so I had Friday the 13th spoiled for me about two hours before I watched it for the first time. Hilarious. And yeah, sure, you know, I've had 40 years to watch this movie, but I wasn't born until this movie was 15 years old, as it was. By the time I was in my teens, the concept of going back to watch an old horror movie seemed boring to me, so I didn't bother to catch up until I was working on this video today. And to think I avoided the spoiler for the ending of Friday the 13th all the way up until the day I watched this, roughly 9,900 days of my life, at which point it was spoiled for me in one of the films I put on preceding it. I know, I know I'm labouring the point here, but I want to communicate to you what a bizarre coincidence it was that I saw this spoiler on the day that I watched this film. I'm not even pretending to be annoyed, I I'm just blown away with the timing. Anyway, let let's get on with the review. Friday the 13th is alright. This movie invented the classic horror setup. A bunch of barely legal teens are isolated somewhere with maybe one single landline phone and no competent adult supervision. They then get stalked and hacked to pieces by a slasher of some kind. Now, this horror setup is so old that it was already seeing itself played to parody by the noughties, which is just when I was starting to take an interest in horror myself, being that I was five years old in the year 2000. My first horror movie of a similar vein was House of Wax, where I got to enjoy Paris Hilton on screen for the better part of two hours, but after that I'm pretty sure I didn't see such a trope played out again until Cabin in the Woods, which, for those of you that don't know, is parody of these tropes taken to their extreme. So to see this trope subverted in the movies that introduced me to horror, and then to go back and watch one of its legendary origins again was weird. Having had it picked apart, dissected, presented back to me, and explained, it's easier to pick out all the different characters, for example, the couple that have sex and are nude on screen and therefore die first, because they're 
slipping off to do something they shouldn't do, but the audience also goes and voyeuristically enjoys it anyway in this weird punishment for an on-screen act intended to titillate. You also have the blonde-haired, hard-working, gracious final girl, who in most cases abstains from sex and is never ever naked and reads books and gets into her two-piece matching silk pyjama set to go to bed, and she's the one who survives until the end with her wit and cunning. My favourite final girl is actually Laurie Strode, because Halloween demonstrates that she is clever because she holds books when she walks around. Anyway, let's summarise the movie. Friday the 13th begins with some kids in a circle singing hallelujah, and two of them give each other the eyes until the song draws to a close, at which point they slip upstairs together to have sex. The two teens are approached by someone that we can't see, the camera is both the perspective the audience views the movie through, and the literal viewpoint of our mystery individual. They also don't speak, conveniently, despite being quite vocal later in the movie, so all we know is that they hate teenagers. They kill the teenagers and the scene ends. The movie continues a few years later, where we follow Annie Phillips, a girl who was hired to be a chef at the camp. Despite warnings from the townspeople, one truck driver, and a man honourably named Crazy Rolf, which is three for three, she hitchhikes with a person who, as with the previous scene, only stares at her through the video camera, remaining unseen to the audience. Annie isn't especially worried by this person's display of silence. She batters on about, if you had this dream as long as I'd had, you'd understand, which is a bit rich for a teenage girl who wants to cook for children, but you know, go off Annie. The listener doesn't say a word either, at least not that we hear, so it ends up looking like Annie is just failing to read the room. Anyway, the driver is the murderer, shocker, I know, and they slash Annie's throat when she tries to run away. Other kids arrive at the camp, Ned, Jack, Bill, Marcy, Brenda, and Alice, who is our final girl. They all get killed off in fairly bloody ways, using a respectable deluge of visceral practical effects. My favourite death was Kevin Bacon, whose head to mannequin attachment was so obvious that I'm surprised no one threw a t-shirt on it to hide the seam. That being said, the visuals were fun, but not gratuitous nor disturbing by, like, my standards, which had been marred by decades of watching horror movies created around the time I grew up and started enjoying horror. I wondered if this disturbing movie iceberg could do with a bit of a reshuffle, considering films like Human Centipede are on tier 2. And I'm by no means suggesting that these films are bad, I'm more highlighting that anybody born after 1990 would naturally run into other, more violent films in their lifetime. Returning to the days of Play-Doh necks and corn syrup blood is almost charming. And while these movies are the big ones of horror cinema, you know, the, the prolifics, the icons, there are lots of other more disturbing movies that I think would suit tier one of a ranking like this a lot better being that they are disturbing, but not as disturbing as tier 2. Things like the Hellraiser series, Event Horizon, The Borderlands, The Descent for example. Just my two cents to be honest. My favourite aspect of this film is that Jason Voorhees is not the killer at all. In fact, until his mum Pamela Voorhees appears to do her villain speech and goes slightly off the rails, he's not really mentioned that much. He's referenced as some kid that drowned following the negligence of previous camp counsellors, setting off the chain of events that led his mother to murder everyone she could get her hands on, but he's not physically present whatsoever during the movie, except for the classic lake shot at the end, which became a staple of the series. Pamela, Jason's mum, is kind of awesome. I love her. She's a steely-eyed woman who seems motherly and gentle, but whose facade slips away at a moment's notice, revealing a dead-eyed psychopath. And I do mean dead-eyed, she stares like she's looking through you. She really is soulless, she is abyssal. I had no idea she was involved in this series at all, since Friday the 13th 2 onwards starts to focus more on the immortal Jason Voorhees, but man, Pam is kind of awesome. I love her. I wish she'd had more influence on horror history and the franchise she's in. I'd have loved to have seen her character and backstory developed a little bit further. Eventually Alice escapes her and just decides to get in a boat. Despite visibly having an oar on deck that you can plainly see, she rows away using one of her hands and then falls asleep in the boat, giving way to the final shot that the series is known for. Overall, Friday the 13th is alright, but with today's lens that I was watching it through, I, I found it quite boring and predictable. Which feels rude, considering it invented the tropes I was already bored of before I ever came around to watch it. The character tropes are laid out as plainly as they were in Cabin in the Woods. The Joker. The couple the virgin, the woman who has sex. Death happens so much on screen that it is crazy how desensitised you become, and practical effects have come a long way since Friday the 13th. If I'd watched it 40 years ago, I'm sure that I would have been on the edge of my seat. But I was a mere twinkle in my dad's ball back then, so unfortunately I can't quite empathise. <laughs> 
Next on our Odyssey of Discovery was Nightmare on Elm Street, a film I have always held in high regard as my mum said it was one of the scariest things she'd ever seen as a youngster, my dad describing to me the horror of a bunch of teens who can't sleep or they'll be murdered. So I was excited to see it and I was surprised to see Johnny Depp here too. He gets an, an introducing credit which I didn't know that they did in cinema which is cool. So first things first, the volume mixing on the version I watched was absolutely fucked. I bought this film on YouTube for like 4 99 and I don't know which version of this movie they've used but the volume mixing is just broken. It's like the dialogue volume is really low, maybe a 4 out of 10, but the sound effects volume was up to, in some segments, 8 out of 10. So there were a few scenes where the actors were talking to each other and there were like car noises in the background and they're having a full conversation and you can't hear it because the sound effects are too loud. Turning the volume up to hear the voices better doesn't work either because you just make the sound effects louder, it's horrendous. I have no idea why this happened, there were no captions either, so I ended up walking away from this film with only approximate idea of what was going on. So something I started to learn about the 80s and 90s slasher fix as my watch session went on is that the characters were never able to figure out what the fuck was going on until like the last third of the film. I was surprised. I must have watched a few of these oldies as a kid, but with Nightmare on Elm Street as a key example, I forgot the way that the film ramps up carefully setting the scene and a good few murders have happened before the teenagers find out that their pursuer is Freddy Krueger and it is even later before they find out why he is pursuing them in the first place. Nowadays, characters are usually fairly aware of what they're dealing with, more or less as or even sometimes before the killings begin to happen. Or the villains of this story will be well established enough in horror canon that the audience doesn't necessarily need an explanation of how they need to operate or the rules of the universe, like for example zombies, which are very much understood by your average audience. So it was really refreshing to watch a film that took the time to establish the villain and the rules of the world. I remember getting about halfway through this film before going, wait a minute, do these kids know about Freddy yet? I don't think anybody's had this conversation at all. And my friends were all like, yeah, they haven't mentioned Freddy yet. Nobody knows who he is yet. And it threw me for a loop, it was bizarre. I guess looking at this through a 2020 lens, I'm like, Freddy is synonymous with the motorway length Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Same for Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, etc. But I suppose that Freddy's reveal had a significant amount of tension for this movie on release. It is wild to consider that this was basically a bedtime whodunit. One thing I appreciated about this movie was how goofy it was. Freddy pops in and out of reality, appearing behind trees, wielding some accordion arms, peeling his own face off, shit like that. And it's very funny, it's really charming, it's self-aware. Freddy is silly and he leans into it hard. Even moments of terror are kind of cute. That being said, the special effects aren't actually horrendous in this. The scene where Johnny Depp gets pulled into the bed and the big fountain of blood comes out and they have to catch him in a bucket after the fact, the way that the first girl to die gets flung around the room, the nightmare sequences, they're entertaining to watch and despite the obviously dated effects, they're fun and well considered enough that our modern minds are not pulled out of it. We see the return of the horror tropes, all of the girls who go to bed in a t-shirt and pants get horrifically murdered and especially the sexually active ones, whereas our pure virgin main character, who takes things slowly with her respectful but far too sexually attempted to be allowed to live boyfriend and does her lord's prayer before she goes to sleep, lives until the end. By the climax of the film we learn that Freddy Krueger had been a serial killer who targeted children, but who was let go on some kind of legal technicality. The kids at the time of the arrest, the parents of our main characters, took justice into their own hands and killed him themselves, and now he's back for revenge, specifically to kill their children. But to return to the topic of purity, I love the religious spine of this movie. There are crucifixes everywhere and everybody says the Lord's Prayer which took me right back to primary school where we had to do the Lord's Prayer every morning, lunch and afternoon. Every day. Nice to see where my school's clear inspiration from. I didn't realise they'd ripped it word for word. I found myself wondering why there was such an emphasis on Christ and reciting the Lord's Prayer. I mean, it's really frequent. It's returned to really often. It's definitely a running motif throughout the movie. Considering Christianity doesn't factor into the resolution of this film whatsoever, so I do wonder and hope that initial drafts of the script involved airdropping Jesus onto the town to fight Freddy in a you know, like hand-to-hand -hand combat. But it's, if this was the original intention, then those scenes have been scrapped. And instead, we had scenes with a heavy emphasis on faith prevailing rather than Jesus throwing down in the ring with Freddy Krueger. 
Instead, we get an ending where the main character discovers that Freddy is powerful only when his victims are afraid. She stands against him menacingly, insisting that she is not scared of you, Freddy, and he just evaporates like a big red bath bomb. Until the cliffhanger, where he appears one final time to drag a mannequin of our main character's mother through the door window while she helplessly stares and screams. This movie was better than Friday the 13th to me, mainly because it just didn't take itself too seriously. The special effects are silly, Freddy is silly. It was a good laugh all around. When I could hear it, of course. Next on the list is Scream, and I love Scream, as I learned. And this one's slightly higher on the disturbing ranking because it has taught me that Matthew Lilliard has a horrendously long tongue. They don't call him Shaggy for nothing, I guess. Again, this probably has a lot to do with my timing in seeing these films for the first time after watching them get parodied to hell. And having seen the scary movie films before this, and in retrospect they, they got this film very right, while I did enjoy the film, I was kind of surprised to find that it's barely a horror. It's certainly a thriller, a sprinkle of murder mystery, even like a tickle of comedy, but it's definitely no horror. As the film begins, we get the standard ghost face phone call that I only saw here for the first time after decades of parody and imitation. He rings the beautiful Drew Barrymore, who responds with surprising tolerance and flirts right back to him. Man, he has a sexy voice. I can fix him. Now, one thing I always took from this era of slasher fix, particularly Friday the 13th and Halloween, is that I assumed it leaned heavily on isolated chasers, not having access to a phone, having to use your wits until you can find one, etc. But, I mean, she literally has a phone in her hand and she doesn't call the police. She threatens to a few times times and Ghostface just responds, we're out in the middle of nowhere, which is a good point, but when he hisses that he wants to see her insides, she still doesn't call the police. You can at least try, Drew. At this point, you may as well try. This film steps out the door already taking swings at common cinema tropes, even down to the finer details, like Drew Barrymore's character having a footballer boyfriend called Steve, who wears that jacket, since all footballers in movies seem to be called Steve. There's also a point where Ghostface snaps to her, you should never say who's there, it's a death wish. You may as well go and investigate a scary noise, hearkening back to the ill-fated horror protagonists who go blundering into every trap they encounter. I can fix him. We can fix him, Seth, can't we? Ghostface asks her to name the killer in Friday the 13th, which she should be able to do if it's indeed her favourite movie. And it took me right back to the time on the stream when somebody asked me if I could name the main character of Resident Evil 4, like it's not Liam Candy, come on guys. This film has definitely had some of the most impressive visual effects of any on this list so far, but that's not a high bar since it's at least 10 years more recent than Friday the 13th and The Nightmare on Elm Street. Still, the guts and stuff look great, well done. By the time we actually get the Ghostface reveal, I was thoroughly enjoying this film, and man, he absolutely absolutely kicks it up a notch. His costume is hilariously cheap. I've seen him parodied so much that it's weird seeing him played straight. Just a man pelting around in pyjamas in the garden, stabbing the shit out of people, falling over. After a fairly interesting prologue, Drew Barrymore gets killed and we move to a new point of view. Aha! It's our final girl, Sydney. I love watching models in their mid-twenties pretending to be dorky 15-year-olds, but I suppose it's better than just having teens getting down on screen. Sydney is brilliant. I really like this actress because 99% of her time spent on screen is acting competently as a normal human woman, and the other 1% is her doing bizarre shit. Like her run, her infamous run, but also how melodramatically she goes, oh my god, when she hears news that her friend, Drew Barrymore, was found dead with her insight on the outside. What visual horror do you think you're fit to judge, Sydney? You're wearing blue on denim, for god's sake. Sydney is one of those characters that parodies the original final girl of horror by mocking the trope of killers chasing big-breasted women who can't act and turning her nose up at horror movies, but has, in turn, been parodied a hundred times over in the years since, so she sits in a weird ignorant self-awareness that we've already seen re-stepped so many times. Watching old movies is a trip, I tell you. Mainly because, while Sydney does highlight and mock the classic tropes of horror, this movie still blunders into buckets of them. For example, by losing her virginity shortly before being attacked the final time, Sydney challenges the virgin final girl stereotype. However, she still exhibits a purity and intellectualism that's consistent with the trope, which means that she never loses that final girl halo of innocence, whilst other teenagers who have less virtuous sex are killed on screen. And this is because it's not about the characters having sex, it's about the characters having sex in a way that the movie respects. As a character, she doesn't subvert or challenge tropes so much as she does just flirt with the idea of them, leaving other characters to fall foul of them and their expected consequence. And I mean, I'll be honest, I don't expect characters to be subverting or challenging tropes, but Scream very definitively tells you that it is subverting and challenging tropes the entire time, so it's weird to see this lack of self-awareness from a film that is intending to parody. This movie keeps a fairly consistent pace, but a good chunk of that runtime is just comically long chase scenes. Still, watching Ghostface Teddy Bear roll around this house 
house is a barrel of goofy laughs. Not as goofy as the police, however, and I love them. I would die for you, Dewey. While the central plot of this film, as with most slashes, just involves the sequential murdering of teenagers, the thriller aspects are emphasised by the presence of the reporter, played by Courtney Cox, incidentally meeting her future husband David Arquette whilst on set, which was so cute considering their accompanying on-screen romance, I was rooting for them, and equally devastated to hear that they divorced ten years ago, what a roller coaster. Anyway, Sydney's mum was murdered a year prior to the events of the film, shortly after having sex with a man who, the reporter believes, was framed for the murder, having had evidence planted in his truck. Sydney pushed hard to have this man sent to prison, whereas the reporter, who is initially framed as a mistrustful snake, believed his innocence and fought for him. When the murders started again, this man still in prison for a crime it's becoming increasingly apparent he didn't commit, the reporter is on Sydney like a fly on shit, and as the only white woman in history to successfully pull off a full yellow suit, I kind of liked her. Courtney Cox's reporter persona harkens back to the old days when paparazzi had absolutely no moral nor legal requirement to be decent humans, so you could just harass people until you had whatever you needed for the story that you wanted to run, so she just walks around the town being like, Miss, how does it feel to know that your mother was savagely butchered? Clearly one of the writers got into a bit of a phrase loop as well because they're constantly like following the savage rape of Sydney's mum last year who was savagely raped, savage rape. There's a point where it becomes something that you can only laugh at, either the ludicrous copy paste job or the stone cold evilness of the reporters who just won't let go. As a 90s film, it really does fall into quite a few of the pitfalls of kind of hating sexually active women. Sydney's mum, for example, apparently had a lot of sex with men. She enjoyed it, consented to it, initiated it, which nowadays nobody would really care that much about. Like, I don't care if my friends have sex and I don't care with who they have sex. And if somebody told me they'd had like 40 sexual partners, I would be like, where did you find the time? Watching the movie, I didn't especially bat an eye hearing that Sydney's mum had had sex. And it was wild how much this movie movie had kind of aged over the last few decades in expecting definitely shock the first time it tells you that Sydney's mom had a lot of sex. It's viewed in this film through a lens of shame. The man who was framed by Ghostface, according to the movie, left his coat at Sydney's mother's house after she seduced him, which is technically true verbiage, but frames her actions as ones of like a malicious succubus. I wasn't sat there enraged or anything, I wasn't pulling my hair out like this is disgusting. It just kept making me laugh more that Sydney would be like, my mum died. And somebody would go, your mum is a whore, Sydney. She is a whore. It is for the good of the town and for the good of your family that she is six feet below the earth. She had so much sex. It is shameful to think about how much sex she had. This film is just this parade of people reminding Sydney that her mum got boned loads. Sydney's boyfriend is framed for the murder of Drew Barrymore and actually arrested, and then it hilariously transpires that no one checked to see if he'd even made a phone call that night, which he hadn't, and he's immediately let go, which is quite extreme. As the movie develops, it really is just a guessing game of who Ghostface is, accompanied by tons of on-screen death and gore. The Fonz is here, ageless, that man never grows. There are references to other horror films, i.e. the striped jumper wearing janitor called Freddy, who made me go, oh, Nightmare on Elm Street reference, like a trained parrot. There's a dude who points out movie cliches. Largely this film is just great fun, both for the things it mocks but also for the things it doesn't realise it's playing completely straight. As the movie concludes we learn that it's not one ghost face, it's two, Matthew Lilliard's character and Sydney's boyfriend Billy who seem to duet their evil villain monologue in the kitchen. Here we find out that Billy actually raped Sydney's mum before he killed her, which he describes as justice. After every character in the movie spent the better part of the last two hours referring to her as a whore deserving of justice in the form of sexual violence and death and Sydney being visibly ashamed of the fact that her mum had a lot of sex. I don't feel like it has the emotional hit that it should have. Like, I felt really bad for Sydney's mum, but I felt like this movie just hated her. And I have to say, it was really nice to see a little bit of gay representation in this film. It was easily the only time I had ever seen Sydney's boyfriend have chemistry with anybody on the cast. <laughs> I actually tried so hard to watch this movie. The Grudge is not available on any UK streaming service. I can't watch it on my mate's Amazon Prime. It's not available on Netflix. You can't buy it on YouTube. Although you can buy the 2002 Japanese original of The Grudge on YouTube without subtitles, so it is entirely in Japanese. I trawled the web to try and find some way of watching this film legitimately. Apparently it's available on Roku, Stars, and Vudu. Three names I do not recognise and will not be giving 
giving my credit card details to free trials be damned and they're probably not available in the UK anyway even if I had pursued those routes. I can't believe I owned this movie on DVD for years and I watched it a hundred times only for it to slip through the cracks a decade later. This film is on the verge of becoming lost footage by this point. Some creepy urban legend movie they'll probably have made campfire stories about a century or so in the future after the fallout from the great energy wars leaves us living on sailboats and fishing up relics from the old days. So yeah, I ended up having to use a VPN for this one. The Grudge is a movie I loved as a teenager. My mum used to occasionally let me dip my shoes into horror I was too young for by renting the DVD for me from the nearby video shop named Tipple and Tape, where you could buy your evening's entertainment and some beer to go with it, and you would assume from the name Chestbinders for the trans men and MBs in your life, like a last minute Valentine's bouquet, but I never saw those. The Grudge we're discussing today will be the 2004 remake of the 2002 Japanese The Grudge, a movie that someone bizarrely felt the need to remake two years after the original came out, presumably so that Western audiences could could watch it with a beloved member of the cast of the live-action Scooby-Doo movie in the saddle. The premise of The Hauntings is described to us very explicitly. The Grudge is a curse born when someone dies in the grip of extreme rage or sorrow, specifically where they died. Those who encounter it also die, even just by entering the location, allowing the curse to be reborn repeatedly, creating a chain of endless growing horror. In the movie, this happens to a woman named Kayako, whose husband thinks she's having an affair with her college professor. She's not quite having an affair, she's just writing about him in her diary and excessively stalking him, but it's enough for the husband to murder her, their son, and their pet cat, which overkill much? The fuck did the cat do to you? But yes. Although the whole family haunts the house, it's Kayako who features the most, especially as the cover art character and presumably the character you would associate the most with the marketing and the film if you've not seen it. She's a little bit corny, she makes a croaking sound which is a good way to raise tension, but by the same merit as soon as you see someone doing it you realise how silly it looks. Her mouth just hangs wide open in a way that isn't uncanny enough to be creepy. It just looks a bit strange like when you catch a toddler staring at you in the supermarket. So it's better when it's off screen, this creepy noise permeating the space with no recognisable source, but it loses all its gravity the second you see the kid physically croaking at you or something. I mean, the little boy is sweet, but he just looks bright blue because of the lighting on him, so he's almost comically smurfy. Anyway, since this is the American remake, an American family moves into the house and things start to go downhill pretty quickly. Although we do have an early on screen death where a man we don't know takes his own life, but at the same time it's the kind of vagary that could be transplanted at the beginning of any movie with no real issues. The care worker, Yoko, is our first death that we actually care about. She goes upstairs to investigate a strange noise, as this so often goes, and ends up in the attic with nothing but a match. It's here that she encounters the Onryo that haunts this house. Do all Onryos look like this? I imagine they do. I'd love to hear if someone knows any further information. Yoko is dragged up into the loft before we even hit the 8 minute mark. Ouch. I'm sorry. Next we discover Karen sleeping soundly while her Ashton Kutcher looking but not really boyfriend tries to find some clean clothes to wear. She invites him back to bed and he's quick to get in, having a conversation with their faces really close to each other. And only 10 years later do I realise how unbearably horrendous her morning breath would be. Karen is also a care worker, the same as Yoko, who died about three minutes prior, and since Yoko has vanished and no one can get a hold of her, Karen needs to go and cover for her. There's a whole bit here about Karen being nervous, about her first solo visit, not speaking Japanese very well yet, and the reassurance that they're an English speaking house. I felt that anxiety. It's actually kind of frightened me from staying abroad long term many times. It was sweet to see it played out here as Karen toddles around the city with her map, asking for directions in careful Japanese, looking confused and nervous. It's also an effective way to demonstrate that her boss Alex is sweet and supportive. I like it. I also adore Karen's sweater. I would like one. The woman Karen is caring for, Emma, has dementia and subsequent lethargic tendencies. She leaves mess all around the house and also accidentally hurts herself on occasion, such as when she thumbs a razor she's holding too hard and slices her hand open. She's not one for chit chat, but I can respect that. We get the impression that Emma was more aware of the ghosts than any of the family right from the beginning and she could sense the presence of the Onryo the moment they set foot into the house. Setting foot into the house curses you immediately, which is an awful shame, but it's interesting that she of all people could tell right from the beginning that there was something wrong. In fact, looking into the past, the ghostly happenings began the moment they viewed the house. There was no ramp up, which the realtor didn't do anything to dissuade them from buying, despite knowing 
knowing about the supernatural incidents himself. Matt's wife Jen, who I initially assumed was his sister and was really confused when they kissed, heard Emma roaming at night. As the conversation continues, we see Jen sincerely struggling to adapt to local life, being unable to read the names of products in the shop, getting lost, being unable to find anyone to help her get home, fumbling with the language, a girl I feel you. As soon as she lays Emma to bed, Karen starts to hear weird sounds and finds a cupboard all taped closed, presumably by Emma, who must be very scared of whatever is haunting that house. Inside the cupboard is a little boy, Toshio. He's weird, but lots of little boys are weird, so Karen is perturbed enough to call for help, but not so perturbed that she does that much about it. I know we're supposed to be scared of the kid, but he is adorable, if not eerie. Karen finds Emma asking the Onryo, who is not visible, to leave her alone. And naturally, Karen mistakes this for symptoms of dementia, only for the Onryo to immediately manifest, murder Emma in front of her, and leave her terrified, traumatised, and unable to move until Alex comes and finds her. Whoops! A woman made of hair came out of the ceiling and killed Emma? Sure thing, Karen. Let's get you in the back of this nice warm car. Let's go. It is surprising how fast this movie ramps up. People are dying fast and easy. The bodies of Matt and his wife Jen, as well as Yoko's jawbone, are found in the attic by the police right after the Onryo starts attacking. This ghost is efficient. I have no complaints about the stakes in this movie. No one is safe. This movie is really enjoyable for what it is. It relies a bit hard on jump scares that tend to culminate in very hammy shots, but I also might be desensitised to the horror of this film, specifically and purely because I watched this on DVD about 80 times when I was a teenager. They attempt to burn down the house, it works, but Karen finds she's still haunted by Keiko, even as the movie ends, setting us up for the inevitable sequels that followed. I loved The Grudge as a teenager, but upon rewatch it has not aged in a way that remains especially scary to me. I really did like the way this movie highlighted the culture shock of moving straight to Japan from America with no language assistance, being an outsider in a new country, having the locals allow you to buy a house they know is haunted, not being able to communicate what's happening or find help. From a social study kind of perspective, it was a really interesting way to view this. It was a good lens. Like, with other Western remakes of traditionally Japanese movies, there's not much of a reason for this remake to be a remake, besides making it more palatable to Western audiences, you know, whilst telling the exact same story, except instead of having a Japanese name, they'll be called like Martha or something. You know, with this, The Grudge makes an earnest attempt to tell a fish out of water story with Karen, highlighting not only her lack of experience and knowledge with Japanese spirituality and supernatural beliefs, but also the country as a whole. Like, Japan isn't hostile to her, she just hasn't found her place there yet. They actually tried to make something of this being an American remake, and it's really respectful. I liked it a lot. There's a cool aspect of inescapable horror and running from the inevitable that a lot of films of that area leaned into, be it The Grudge or The Final Destination, and I do really like it, but I feel like Keiaku's design is just a bit too hammy. She's better when she's both inevitable and not quite tangible. You know, like the hand on the back of the head in the shower, the leftovers of the people she's killed, the face in the pitch black. She's inescapable. When she's just some woman crawling around with her mouth and eyes wide open, it loses the horror for me quite a lot. And you know, I could do that, and maybe I will. Next up is Child's Play, the genesis of one of our most prolific icons of horror cinema ever, Chucky the Doll, as portrayed by Brad Dorif, or Grima Wormtongue if you're a based Chad-pilled, two towers-pilled Lord of the Rings enjoyer, and he does a fantastic job. In fact, I can't decide who I like him as more now, Grima or Chucky. This man has some good range. And he's not the only solid actor in the series. The kid, Andy Barkley, was a pretty talented actor. On a scale of early Daniel Radcliffe to, well I mean, I feel like Andy Barkley is now at the top of my scale. And I'm sorry, Danny Raddy, I love you. You're one of my favourite actors, but Philosopher's Stone, that's all I can say. Bless you. It's not your fault. You were a kid, but bottom of the skill. Before Child's Play, I remember watching the Spawn of Chucky movie when I was a teenager. Me and my friend Mel sat outside a bank on the floor, and we watched that film on an MP4 player, sharing a pair of headphones. I remember enjoying it, besides the troubling puppet sex scene, which I mean is bizarre, but it's funny and schlocky. Returning to Child's Play, I didn't expect it to be played so straight, nor have such an injection of voodoo mind transfer magic as it does, because it has some, and some is more than I think most people would expect. Child's Play begins with a chase, fugitive serial killer Charles Lee Ray being chased through Chicago by Detective Mike Norris, a man who reminds me too much of my dad to be attractive. As Charles gets shot and dies, he falls onto a toy display, knocking down a good guy, a little doll that looks like a police sketch of a football hooligan. He does this voodoo chant thing, there's a lot of lightning, the store explodes, and he's pronounced dead on scene. And what I found bizarre 
bizarre about how the movie continues was the insistence it had on playing things straight. Like, it's a slow burn, it ramps up tension, rather than being some gratuitous slasher film based around how far we can stretch a murder before it's a straight up desecration, Child's Play focuses on how a series of murders are quite naturally blamed on the only physical, unharmed witness, Andy Barclay, the son of our main character, Karen. Yes, the second Karen of the disturbing movie Iceberg. Chucky will kill someone, Andy will say, Chucky did it. Everyone will naturally be looking at this child with suspicion as he is completely unharmed in an apartment by himself after, for example, his babysitter being knocked out of the window with his own toy hammer. Shortly afterwards, he's found outside like a blown up house looking for his doll in the rubble. Andy gets put in a mental institute while they figure out what on earth to do with him, and Chucky finally starts showing up to tie up loose ends. In the process of going back to murder all the people who wronged him, he stops by the house of the man who taught him voodoo magic and learns that his doll body is becoming human, slowly growing organs and circulatory systems and whatnot. Despite the fact that he is a toy, he grows more human every minute, eventually getting a heart, meaning he can be killed, not that he can love, obviously, so he needs to use the ritual to transfer himself into a new body, a human one. Chucky is one of those horror characters that has precisely the level of speed and strength required for any set piece he needs to be a part of. Is he so fast that he can appear anywhere at a moment's notice? Is he so strong that he can strangle a man to death with his own body weight, take out any number of armed guards, or does he flip-flop lifelessly when trying to attack Andy's mum? Is he too slow to chase them? It literally depends on what the movie needs. In a kind of meta way, it ups the stakes because the writers lacks attitudes towards the rules of this universe means that anything could happen. But in a schlocky 80s movie way, it keeps the stakes firmly measured because none of the actual main characters are ever in any danger. Ultimately, I don't have a load to say about Child's Play. I liked it a lot. I probably won't watch it again, but it was nice to see the birthplace of this marathon-esque length series of films. So let's move on to something else. The Conjuring is up next, and I was worried that I had again fucked it by watching Annabelle first, which is a prequel and we'll discuss that later, especially since they have the same opening sequence which was very confusing, but thankfully they're not even slightly related. I was grateful about this, I didn't want a huge self-imposed spoiler. Now I watched this movie for the first time for this video and most people will be relieved to know that I loved this, so let's get into it. This movie was directed by James Wan, but it bears no connection to his other film in this list, Insidious, which is confusing considering that Patrick Wilson again makes an appearance as another completely unrelated main character, Ed Warren, based on some real man. I love the idea that they had Patrick Wilson on some multi-film deal or something. His contract said he had to be the main character of everything James Wan makes, no idea, but I love that he made a return. I was initially so confused, assuming that maybe he was the father or grandfather of the deadbeat dad in Insidious. Since they're played by the same man, maybe it was supposed to represent familial links, familial familiarity, like Patrick Wilson's genes are so strong that all of his sons are an identical copy. I stole the observation from my friend and will provide no credit. I am the Elon Musk of writing scripts. I am terminally divorced. Anyway, Ed arrives with his wife Lorraine Warren in the 1960s and they really are dressed for it. They look awesome in costume. The main strength of this film is its effort to teach its audience about demonic possession. Regardless of your personal beliefs, and for the record, not that it matters that much, but mine are extremely atheist, this is a really interesting angle the film takes, using these instances of possession as a teaching opportunity. We learn that while there was an Annabelle doll, the doll itself was not alive, but rather it was used as a conduit to give the impression of possession. Like, that's cool. I love learning. My favourite thing about Annabelle is just how dirty and gross she is. We see a flashback to a pair of dishevelled nursing students who bought Annabelle because we're nurses, we help people. And I'm sat there wondering why they couldn't have taken a baby wipe to her. No one ever does. I bet she reeks of shit. Now, this seems to be around the time in the James Wan timeline where he realised that jump scares get thrill-seeking audiences very horny. So this movie is absolutely crammed full of them. They are ludicrously bass boosted too. There is one where Annabelle knocks really loudly on the door and it's so bass boosted that the volume itself is like deep fried. Like those old Monsters Inc soundtrack videos that blow your headphones out. The segment focusing on Annabelle is short because it neatly packages us an instance of possession and presents it to us in a way that's easy to understand and digest, allowing Ed Warren to explain a lot of how possession works to us before we get to see the big one. And it's not long before we do encounter the big one. A family moves into some rural house somewhere and they have like 
way too many kids. The first thing these kids do, naturally, is play hide and seek with blindfolds on so that they can start breaking things, getting lost, and having creepy encounters without a reasonable expectation of running away from them. The inevitable happens when one of the kids accidentally breaks a hole in a hollow wall, a fake wall, down into some long forgotten basement covered in dust. The dad hops down, using matches to explore it, which is very brave. There was clearly an immense amount of effort the previous owners of this house made to seal off this basement, and this random ass pack of kids found it in the first hour, which has to sting. The tension in this film has a lot of, I'd like to look away so I don't get jump scared, but I'm desperate to see what happens moments, which is up to you if you want to like that kind of horror. You know, I'm not your dad. The parents decide to christen the new house by making another baby in it. God, I hope they bought condoms, that family is far too big. And the mum wakes up all bruised, probably from kneeling on those barren old floorboards during said christening. This house is a fixer-upper for sure. Gosh, it looks rough, just like her knees. The haunting symptoms start small and ramp up, similar to Insidious, which I love and again is used as a learning opportunity for the audience. It marries the audience's craving for answers with the build-up of tension and stakes, allowing audiences to get the answers they really want without giving them everything. I think it is so effective. The clock keeps stopping at 3.07, which the characters describe as weird. Yeah, sure. Then, bad smells, things turning on and off, doors opening and closing, the dog won't go into the house so they leave it outside and it's dead by the morning, which could easily be written off as a wild animal attack. One of the daughters sleepwalks and just stands in front of a big wardrobe, banging her forehead against it, but like, sleepwalkers are weird. Not many red flags yet. My only gripe coming into this movie was that the family moves into a house and then haunted things start to happen to them is a genre tried, tested and exhausted by now. And I feel like it needs a bit of a spruce, this whole family horror house genre, which is a shame because this movie is based on an actual true story that has been adapted. So of all the films, I feel like this one has a good reason to be squatting in these deep tread tropes, and yet it just came at a time when I was really bored of it, which is unfortunate. They try the blindfold game again because this is a family that doesn't learn that it's probably better to get your bearings a bit in a new house before playing a game that requires you to move around in it without being able to see. Naturally, there's a little change up this time. The mom gets fucked with by a ghost. She hears breathing, goes to investigate gay only to hear her kid behind her. She rips off the blindfold to see nothing there. It's a good scene, it's really tense, even if the use of the blindfold game as a narrative device made me roll my eyes a bit with its on the noseness. The film doesn't blow its beans like Insidious either when that big Darth Maul tomato face demon starts showing up and fucking with everybody, at least at first. Later on there's a scene where an old woman launches herself off the spooky wardrobe Spider-Man style onto the kid, who spends the better part of the next five minutes rolling around and squealing, miraculously unharmed and it's so good. But on the whole, The Conjuring plays its cards really well. This film reminds me of that painting of the dog staring into the open door and it's completely black beyond the threshold. You know, it's creepy and you want to stare into it to find what the dog is looking at. But to stare into the dark might mean something bursts back out at you, so you're too scared to look. I don't know, I think it works well. There's a lot of dark corners in frame, lots of mirrors, open doors, in scenes which gives this feeling of vulnerability and being watched. Although the build-up does go on a little bit too long, it's a well put together movie. I can at least appreciate the scenes for their setup, even if I was tapping my foot a bit for the investigators to arrive soon. Short, the movie starts to pick up with loud noises in the night that the mum has to get out of bed to investigate. She does that slow walk around the house where she checks every corner, walking through all of the dark doorways and hallways until something really loud happens. It's a formula I am weird tired of. I want to hear Patrick Wilson tell me about the ghost types and explain what a ghost orb is. Come back, Patrick! Sorry for making fun of your Herculean genetics. Finally, finally, the mum of the family goes to one of Ed Warren's lectures and meets him afterwards to beg him for help. He insists it's late, but by the time he turns up at their house a few hours later, it's like, still definitely the middle of the day. It's a quirk of the narrative that was so obvious that even for a mindless viewer like me, it made me laugh. But it didn't matter. The Warrens were here and I was hungry for this scenes. I love the Warrens. Despite the fact that I kept getting confused and referring to Ed Warren as Ed Gein, which is a whole other kettle of fish. There's one scene where the wife is hanging up some sheets and you know for sure you'll see a silhouette of a ghost, but more importantly, our dear Patrick Wilson gets all intimate with his wife because she's doing laundry like, God, it arouses me so much when you do the things my mum does. The running theme of these movies is Oedipus, change my mind. Mr. Warren is channeling his mummy issues into these films. The Warrens have a lot of baggage, and I love baggage, most specifically a recent exorcism 
Susan Lorraine was present for. She saw something so horrible that she drew into herself for a short time. When pressed for details about it, Ed murmurs, I'd never ask her what she saw. Like, dude, I would. Give us the gossip, Lorraine, come on. Although the paranormal investigators arrive kitted out and ready to collect evidence for the church, they're a little bit too late, since the cogs of this particular haunting have been turning for a while. By the time they step things up, the ghost is powerful enough to be defensive, and the possessions happen fast. The mum is possessed, as we learned the previous mum of the house was possessed, forced to murder her children, and then took her own life by hanging herself in like the weird inner wall bit of the home, like the insulation bit. I enjoyed the scene where the ghost decides to start really freaking these people out. The house rumbles, crucifixes start flying, then there's an amount of silence before it all goes to shit. The action hits hard, although it probably could have done with a few deaths, being that the action carries on just a bit too long for the stakes to start wearing off, like the ghost very specifically seems to pull punches. Either that or they're just less powerful than they seem. Anyway, the Warrens would typically need permission from the Vatican and a representative sent over to perform the exorcism, like holy roadside assistance. However, this case of possession is so extreme that the exorcism gets pushed through regardless and it falls on the Warrens to have to perform it since no representative will reach them in time. Simultaneously, Ed and Lorraine's daughter gets attacked by a CGI chair miles away from the exorcism, like the ghost is trying to threaten him. Like, maybe the ghost asked some friends to help shake this poor kid up. I guess it's Annabelle being kept in a cabinet in their home, which is just natural selection at this point, you know, get a big yellow storage. Why is that doll Neil daughter? I don't know, I think I'm old enough now that horror movies that used to terrify me no longer really do, but The Conjuring bridged the gap of entertainment. If you can't be scary, be interesting. I loved it. Annabelle sits really high up on this list, not because of any in-movie events that especially disturbed me, but because on the evening before watching this movie, I walked to the shop and I bought an entire rack of ribs to take home and eat the following day. The morning of watching Annabelle, I was so excited for my ribs that I cooked them at 10am and ate them while watching the movie, and I've never felt so sick in my life. For the rest of the day, I was unbelievably nauseous and so uncomfortable. I had to have the window open to suck in the fresh air, I had to have a light down. It, I wasn't even particularly full. It was just so gross and so sickly and so sweet. I'll never eat ribs again and now whenever I think about Annabelle I feel sick the same way I did with those ribs. The titular Annabelle is a doll based on a real life doll that is apparently haunted. The real life doll is kind of goofy looking, kind of cute, yeah, you know, you could never make a horror movie with her prancing around, but the doll they make up for this movie crosses the line of believability. It's hideous, even for a porcelain doll, who the fuck would buy this? Despite what you'd expect after watching The Conjuring, to which Annabelle is a prequel of sorts, there's not a ton of setup in that movie for this one and vice versa. They're clearly intended to be standalone viewings and I kind of prefer that. Annabelle focuses on a job and his wife Mia who is pregnant. This man, clearly the king of giving nice gifts, buys a new doll for the baby's room, Annabelle. Well, she's not called Annabelle yet, she's just a doll. Granted, Mia is very happy to receive this gift, but then again, she's a housewife living in 1955. She's probably never left the same three square miles in her life. Things get moving fast. During the night, we see the neighbors get brutally murdered, which I initially thought was Annabelle pulling the strings from her doll body, but not quite, because it turns out that Annabelle isn't even possessed yet, and she's not even called Annabelle. The home invasion set their sights on John and Mia and hell yes, I appreciate a character in a movie who actually phones the police and when John came in and kicked the shit out of her attackers I was cheering for them. Yes, good for you, power couple. Turns out that the home invaders are cult members, the woman being named Annabelle who slits her own throat rather than die at the hands of the police. Her blood soaks into the doll, who I quickly began to realise was now Annabelle. Fantastic, I'm on the same page, thank you for explaining. Mia is rushed to the hospital because of her poor tummy, because she was stabbed in her belly which is it's horrible to watch. But she recovers well and she and John seem to be more in love than ever. To be fair, after his act of selfless heroics, I would be pretty happy to be babied up. You know, it's a give and take. From this point onwards, the movie becomes a timeline of watching this doll grow dirtier and dirtier. Just a time lapse of comedic and continual filth. As with The Conjuring, paranormal events start small and build up, well until after the couple have their daughter Leah. Despite having thrown the doll away shortly before the new family moved house, John finds Annabelle packed in one of their boxes and the paranormal events continue. It's just an extremely standard ghost affair of Insidious, The Conjuring and Annabelle. The Conjuring is definitely the most interesting and the most fun to watch. Considering the great cast of characters and the fact that this movie has a backbone of being a lesson, it's, it's intended to inform, which helps you learn and lets you kind of dig in for delicious details without telling you too much. Annabelle is the possession story, but with no explanation, meaning that it just feels bog standard and it falls so flat. 
We find out that the cult were, for unspecified cult reasons apparently, trying to summon a demonic spirit, yada yada yada. It's hardly a new story. The demon wants a soul for some reason, presumably in exchange for being summoned, which just begs the question of why you would summon a demon just to pay it for the pleasure, but whatever. There is a little bit of explanation from Father Perez who talks us through the basics of demon possession, but I'd already kind of written the whole affair off by this point and demon possession is like the number one explained paranormal event in the media. The most interesting twist of this story is the end, where the demon genuinely genuinely is sated by a soul, which I found bizarre and chilling. Mia's new friend, a bookstore clerk, is very quick to sacrifice herself and apparently her entire soul. I would be tempted to sacrifice myself on behalf of a newborn baby, sure, but man, my soul? Like the whole thing? And how long does the demon get it for? I'm gonna need some details before I commit to this, like a demon lawyer. Anyway, the friend does what needs to be done and dies by jumping out of a window and the hauntings just end there. Like a year after the initial attack, they are wrapped up so straightforwardly. I never expected to the demon to be honest, nor fear, nor happy to take whatever it is given and nothing more. I never thought they would play by the rules. Maybe I was wrong about you, demon. Maybe the real possession was my own prejudice. Finally on our list is The Ring, a 2004 movie that has held up, in my opinion, the best of all these films. I really, really enjoyed The Ring. The film married together a solid premise, a gripping story, some very interesting characters and some honest scares. As far as horror goes, The Ring went above and beyond and I was lapping it up the whole way. It's really good. This movie starts like a porno, featuring two adult actresses cast as definitely not teenagers but trying really hard, wearing their school uniforms sitting on a bed together. There's even a pillow fight, which is never an incredible sign of a film's quality, but I mean, do they really expect you to watch the setup? Most people tend to skip 10 seconds forward at a time until they get to the bit they want to see, usually the most replayed section anyway. One of them shares a spooky story about a cursed videotape, saying that she watched it, and it has now been seven days. She leaves the room and the other girl heads downstairs, grabbing what looks like a glass of cum. As she's heading back up to the bedroom, the TV turns on, her friend has vanished. Long story short, the friend who watched the videotape, surprise surprise, has died. I think so anyway. I watched the opening scene from behind my hands, so I heard a scream at one point and little else. This is such a tense movie, but it's really good. And the visuals we see in a brief flash during a later funeral scene are gross and troubling. I've not seen a dead body, in, in a movie of course, look as weird as they look in the ring. There's never blood or gore in this film, but the corpses are bruised and twisted with uncanny deformed and bulging eyes. The reveal is often accompanied with a noise sting that makes me jump so bad my body takes a screenshot. They are seared to your brain, it's gross. It's been a while since I've encountered the classic horror movie trope where the horror starts as a ghost story that children tell each other. Like there's some secret underbelly of the world full of supernatural horrors on some middle school black market under the ignorant eyes of their parents. Besides A Nightmare on Elm Street if you'd count that, but I don't know if I would count that. As we move from the prologue of this movie we meet Rachel, whose first few lines are somehow delivered very badly despite the fact that she's very competent for the rest of the film. Like she hadn't quite found her acting sea legs when the first scenes were shot, so it kind of feels like they just filmed her warming up and then never reshot the scenes. Anyway, Rachel introduces us to my favourite character, Aiden, her son. This kid is amazing. He's like a 40 year old and child's body, more put together than his forgetful and at times negligent mother. He often ends up making sure she gets ready for work and has become super resourceful at getting what he needs, he walks himself to school, and it's sad that he had to grow up so fast, but it's understandable understandable because this woman is not an especially apt mum. My perhaps quite cruel observation is proven during a conversation between Rachel and Aiden's teacher who shows her drawings that Aiden has been doing in class of his dead cousin lying in her grave. All the teacher wants is for Rachel to just check in with him and make sure he's okay. And Rachel is like, this is just his way of working things out, leave him alone, mind your own business and get over it. Like yeah, kind of valid, you know, he might just be working through things but also yikes he is Rach, maybe just check in with him? I have no idea who we were supposed to root for in this movie, presumably not Rachel. Over the course of the film we see that she is a flawed individual, most notably demonstrated by the ending but we'll get there in due time. So there's definitely a little bit of wiggle room that the film expects us to feel about the main character. You know, she's clearly not perfect, which is fine by me, but especially in the early scenes of the movie, she is so emotionally negligent towards her son that I am stunned that it's not a later reveal in the movie that that she's secretly hated him the whole time. At best, she is carelessly unaware of him, and at worst, she almost spitefully blocks any opportunity he has to find help. You know, she's so strangely written, like, are we supposed to like her? 
Still, I do love Aiden. Rachel offers to read him a goodnight story and he just blurts back, I'm tired, dismissing her with a quiet utterance. Sorry you have to live with this woman, Aiden, but I'm glad you've got the self-esteem to not be clamouring for her attention and coming away with nothing but disappointment. Expectations have most certainly been set. You can see the difference between The Ring and the movies of the 80s that are included on the list, which played fast and loose with the concept of providing answers, often leaving basic reveals until well after the halfway point. In The Ring, we get our first speculations at the funeral of the young woman who died in the prologue, manned by a family of gorgeous blonde women. They each speculate about what might have happened, the death was a mystery, some claim it was a stroke, but damn, the cut to the dead body just shit me up. Anyway, Rachel's a reporter, so naturally she is keen to learn more. And there were a few scenes about her that cropped up, which I really did like, which only calls further into question her initial characterization of being a maliciously negligent parent. At one point, her boss walks over to her and goes, you're fired. And she just laughs at him and goes, no, I'm not. I kind of loved her for that. Baffled and clearly not having rehearsed a response for this, this potential conversation in his head, he just walks off helplessly, as he should. Rachel finds out about the tape that kills people after seven days. To cut a very long story short, she steals it from where it's being kept, some log cabin campsite called Shelter Mountain Inn, and watches it on one of their big TVs. The videotape in this film is infamous, and it's not just for the premise. The imagery is really gross, really uncomfortable, but awesome. Fingers punctured by nails, hair yanked out of throats, eerie visions of a woman brushing her hair in an ornate oval mirror, churning black water, a spinning chair which saw a hilarious parody in the later scary movie release, and the vision of an eclipse far above the head of the viewer, tiny dudes in the mud. Awesome, gross, unsettling. I don't think you could ever make a genuinely scary, frightening videotape, since being scared is such a subjective experience, and in terms of things that age poorly, I think that horror visuals are pretty high up there. So I feel like unsettling is the best thing to aim for. It's the easiest to achieve, because anybody can be unsettled, and most people will be unsettled by like the same group of things, so you can cast a wide net with only a short segment. And man, I started to love Rachel's whole vibe. Despite her role as a mother, I did like her as a character. She gets a very real phone call where the caller whispers seven days to her down the phone, and she's like, oh shit, this is real. I have to go and show this to literally everybody. First thing she does is show it to her ex-boyfriend Noah, which is just so out of pocket. I was laughing so hard. Rachel makes a copy of the tape here, and put a pin in that for later. This man Noah has the brightest eyes I've ever seen. I'm awed by him. He also doesn't really believe her, leaving Rachel to go and do all this digging by herself and man, pre-internet days were really so recent. This wasn't even 20 years ago and there's no internet for her to rely on at all. Rachel has to go trawl through mountains of books, newspaper clippings, she has to go to some VHS room to watch the video and pause on specific frames, she runs the audio through some stuff. Man, I'm, I'm barely technically proficient in the modern day, I can't decide for these ancient doohickeys. Rachel, mother of the year, wakes up that night to find Aiden watching the tape. I mean, I am not sure I can entirely blame her, the kid as we learn is some kind of psychic. The ghost in the TV, the details we'll learn more about later, can speak to him and instruct him to watch the tape, so I imagine even if she'd hidden the tape well, he'd probably still have rustled it out. Still, I feel like you probably should have locked it away, slept with it under your mattress, somewhere your child, who wakes up earlier than you, isn't going to find it and put it in the VCR, thinking it's some kind of TOTS TV special. Well, what's done is done now, Rachel. They learn that the woman brushing her hair in the tape was called Anna, who jumped to her death off the cliffs of Moesco Island, where she lived. Running short on time, Rachel and Noah go and investigate further. On the way, a horse on Rachel's ferry, a beautiful CGI stallion, spooks and jumps into the water, getting all ripped up in the rotary blades. We see the water turn deep red, mirroring the shot from the cursed tape, showing us that not only can the tape show images from the future, it also potentially shows different images to every viewer. It's another level of supernatural ability for this tape, it's very cool. On the island, we learn that Anna was infertile. She and her husband went away and came back with Samara in some kind of eerie sounding adoption. Only, Samara is some kind of of psychic, she can etch images into people's minds, and she used this ability to drive her parents insane and also cruelly torment the horses that her mum owned. Although she was institutionalised and treated by doctors, the movie makes it clear that Samara was just fundamentally evil, using her powers the way she did simply because she wanted to. Just one of those eerily unfixable children. I do wonder why, but while the later films might explain, this film never goes into it. This extremely powerful child just loves tormenting the people around her as her favourite thing to do. Richard, Anna's survivor 
surviving husband and the only one who can provide ample answers, electrocutes himself in the bathtub. So yeah, you know, it looks like our crack investigators are back to the books. Rachel finds an image of a tree burned into the wood of the barn where Samara's parents made her sleep, the tree from Shelter Mountain Inn, and off she and Noah go again. With less than a day left, they return to the inn where an unfortunate spill uncovers a dip in the floor. There's something beneath the house, it's a well. Shoving the lid off, we realise that the eclipse from the videotape is the vision Samara had from the foot of the well, staring up as the sky was blocked from view, where her mum left her to die of starvation over the course of seven days. A TV begins to dip into the hole where Rachel is staring down into the well and pinging loose from its plug, it lands on her and pushes her right into the well. She falls and lands thankfully in the water, only to discover Samara's long decomposed corpse. Rachel is rescued, believing that by finding Samara's body and properly putting it to rest, she is now happy and they are now safe. And no, not quite. After a heartfelt reunion with Noah, the two of them having rekindled feelings, Noah is attacked and killed by Samara. Aiden warned Rachel that it was a mistake to try and help Samara. Honestly, kid, I'd have loved a bit of insight into this earlier. Why is it a mistake? Is there any course of action that wouldn't be a mistake? If you can speak to Samara, can you maybe talk her down? I feel like you're not pulling your weight here, Aiden. Although Rachel seems to have not pulled her own weight for a lot of Aiden's childhood, so maybe this was as mean-spirited an act of revenge as Samara's own killing spree. Go on, Aiden. As it turns out, cast your mind back to Rachel making a copy of that tape, Samara wants the curse to spread, specifically by a victim of said tape making a copy of the tape and showing it to somebody new, thereby allowing Samara to perpetuate her killings. I don't know why she wouldn't kill Rachel too despite Rachel making a copy, you know, Rachel's work is done, Samara can't kill her, nor can Samara continue to exploit Rachel. So Rachel going on living only allows Rachel to warn people of the tapes. And even though Rachel naturally has to show people the tape, she can also keep people safe by explaining to them precisely how to pass the curse along. So she actually becomes a bit of an issue for Samara. It doesn't particularly make sense why Samara would keep her alive. This film concludes with Rachel helping Aiden make a copy to spread to others. I think this final act of unadulterated evil is probably my favourite part of Rachel's characterisation, particularly in the sense of her being flawed, especially as a mother. What she did is tantamount to murder. She has given an unwitting person a cursed tape in order to save her son's life. It's like the trolley problem in full force, except the person on the rail is your literal child. Like, the choice is clear. She's evil. It's understandable sympathetic and many of us would do the same thing in her shoes, but it's still evil. To compare her earlier characterization as a spitefully negligent mother whose emotional abandonment of her son has left him in a situation whereby he's needed to create the persona of like a 30 year old accountant roommate just to get by every day. This is a, this evolution is one that I can understand even if I judge it negatively as an onlooker. Come on Rachel, I, I at least hope that you told these poor future victims what to do with it. I think also it contributes to this idea of what makes a good parent and it's it's a good comparison to Insidious all the way back at the start of the list as well like Josh sets his fear aside and helps his son after doing nothing and Rachel throws everybody under the bus for the sake of helping her son. Both of these parents are fairly empathetic in their own way. So that's all for tier one of the disturbing movie iceberg and I really hope you enjoyed it. Nothing on this list was especially horrible but I guess that's what tier one is for I suppose, like setting the foundation, easing us in. I didn't expect the topic of women and sex to be so relevant honestly but it felt so notable in so many of these films that I, I had to mention it a lot because it just it just really stood out to me in a lot of these movies and I hope you can understand at least why I felt the need to discuss it. Like I said before this was a Patreon pledge that we reached very recently when we hit a certain number of monthly pledges, I can't remember what the specific number was, but we shot through that goal. And if you would like to see tier two sooner rather than later, drop a pledge over on my Patreon and we'll keep moving towards the next goal of covering tier two of the disturbing movie Iceberg, where we'll be discussing the likes of the human centipede and things like that. So, you know, that'll be nice, I'm sure. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching. You know, feel free to share your own rankings and tiers of these movies in the comments below. Which other movies would you put on tier one of the disturbing movie Iceberg? Which ones were your favourites and least favourites, your most and least disturbing, and also your general opinions. I'll see you next time guys, bye!